So th by this point in the timber framing unit, you will have read a lot of theory about coupled roofs, but at the moment you've been dealing with a lot of two-dimensional drawings and uh, some of the three-dimensional drawings that, that you have looked at in AS1684 will have been a bit cluttered and it may have been a little bit difficult for you to understand how all of these members relate to each other and where they all sit within the roof frame. So we're going to try and turn a two-dimensional drawing like you can see on the screen in front of you into a three-dimensional uh, object that will hopefully help you understand how a coupled roof works. So if we move now over to our 3D model, we're just simply looking right now at a basic wall frame. Now don't worry about scale or sizes at the moment, this is all just a diagrammatic uh, representation for you so that you can see how these all go in together. Now the first thing you can you can note though with this is notice that the internal walls here they all have double top plates. So in a coupled roof uh, you will often find that the roof is supported on the internal walls so the internal walls will become load bearing and therefore they will have double top plates like the external walls generally will. If this was a trust roof none of the internal walls would be load bearing and therefore there'd be a single top plate on the internal walls there to provide a gap between the underside of the trusses and the top plate so that if the trusses sag at all they don't they don't come and sit down on top of those walls. Okay so we can see here it's a little L-shaped building, we've got our major roof happening here, there'll be a gable end on here, a uh, broken hip here and then over this little L-shape, the, the little poke out section at the base of the L-shape is another gable, uh, sorry is another hip. So the first thing that we're going to look at is we're actually going to uh, start forming this up not in the way that uh, carpenters on site might form it up but we're I'm just trying to build uh, from the bottom up for you so that you can have an understanding of how it goes together. So the first thing we're going to look at is our ceiling joist. So this would be a fairly typical ceiling joist layout for a, a project like this. Uh, it, it may vary uh, depending on where your internal load bearing walls are but for the layout that we've got this is fairly standard. So we have our, uh, our ceiling joist coming through in our major roof section. In our minor roof section we've got um, the ceiling joist running perpendicular to the major ceiling joist and then we have these little jack ceiling joists at the edges here. Um, so this is where we can't put a ceiling joist right on, on the, these end walls here because they're hip, wall, uh, hip roof sections and the ceiling joist would get in the way of the rafters. So we need to have this little jack joist jack ceiling joist coming through here. You'll notice on this corner here we've got a bit of ceiling joist on the flat. Now that's so that it doesn't interfere with the hip rafter when it comes through. Uh, what you have to remember is that at this point here the main aim is that we want something to support our ceiling lining. So where our major uh, ceiling joists are actually acting as ties as well as supporting the ceiling lining, they're acting as ties keeping the walls upright uh, for our coupled roof, they're coupling the roof together. Um, at this point here we don't uh, have any need for a ceiling joist to do that but we do have a need for it to provide a fixing point for our uh, ceiling patterns or for direct fixed ceiling lining. So that's why we have this on the flat here. It'll become more obvious um, once you start seeing the roof build up. So uh, the first thing that we need to look at as well here, again because of that, is we've got this wall coming through here and it doesn't line up with our ceiling joist, um, but it will need to have ceiling lining come up and sort of butt in and go around that wall. So we need something to fix the ceiling lining to at this point and this is where we start putting in our uh, ceiling trimmers. So if we turn on our ceiling trimmers layer there, you can see the ceiling trimmers come through. They're acting like the ceiling joist, uh, ceiling jack ceiling joist do on this end. Our ceiling trimmers are just coming through. They're, they're just spreading in between those two ceiling joists there so that the uh, plasterboard can go around that wall. All right, now if we look at those ceiling joists, some of them are spanning some pretty large distances there. Uh, you could say, and uh, so that the size isn't too huge, we 
we may want to put a support going through the middle to break up that span so that it's, it goes from a single span like it is at the moment into a continuous span. Two even spans on either side makes it a continuous span, gets the size of the beam, it gets the size of the ceiling joist down. So to do that, this is where we start looking at our hanging beams. So we turn on our hanging beam. So we've got a hanging beam now going straight through the middle there. So this is where our support is happening here in the end wall. It's, uh, it's blocked up so that it comes over the top of our ceiling joists and our ceiling joists are fixed underneath the uh, hanging beam there. So it's sitting on the wall here and on this end we've actually got a ceiling, a jack ceiling joist acting as the block on this end as well so that that uh, hanging beam is supported on this wall here and uh, the blocking is being provided by the jack ceiling joist. So there's one problem though because we were talking about trying to reduce the span of these ceiling joists and now we've got a hanging beam that spans even further. So this is where we turn around and we bring in or well, we introduce the concept of our counter beam. So if we put a counter beam in in the middle and we split that hanging beam span up and it sits on the sits directly on the walls it runs parallel to the ceiling joist but it doesn't actually sit on the ceiling joist it's just running parallel to it and it's sitting on the wall there on either end and we have our hanging beam coming now and it's supported in the middle by that counter beam so the hanging beam is spanning between this wall and the counter beam and then between the counter beam and that external wall on that end we have our ceiling joist spanning between the external wall and the hanging beam and then from the hanging beam to the external wall on the other end again. Now if without the hanging beam and the counter beam these ceiling joists could quite easily end up being the same size as what this counter beam is here which is quite large so the whole point of adding in these two additional members is to keep the size of the ceiling joists down there's generally a lot more ceiling joists than there are counter beam and hanging beams and therefore we bring down the cost of the construction of the roof considerably all right so that's our ceiling structure now we're going to start building up our roof structure so the first thing that we go, that I'm going, the first layer that I'm going to turn on now, um, are our ridge boards. Now remember, in a coupled roof structure, we have ridge boards, not ridge beams. So they are essentially not uh, providing any structural support other than to provide a meeting point for the pairs of rafters that are happening on either side. So we'll turn on our major ridge and our minor ridge first. And so they're sitting up there, they don't mean much until we turn on our major uh, hip and our minor hip and our minor valley. And then now we can start seeing the form of the roof. So remember I mentioned before that we have a gable end on this end, we have a hip end here and this is called a broken hip. So this is where the two roofs are joining in together. So you can see we've got our ridge boards are in, in the grey, we've got our our hip rafters are in yellow and our valley rafter is in yellow as well coming through here. All right, so they all provide the major framework there to simply support the ends of our rafters. Our rafters are doing most of the heavy lifting at this point. So there are our pairs of rafters. Notice that we have a pair of rafters here. And we have our ceiling joists coming through. The ceiling joist isn't taking any load from the rafters, the ceiling joist is simply taking ceiling load, but where it is connected on the external wall, they are pinned together and we are creating our triangle for our structural integrity in our coupled roof. So again, you can see that the pairs of rafters, they're meeting up on the ridge board up here. And then again, where our hips are, our pairs of rafters are meeting at 90 degrees along our hips and in our valleys and where our jack ceiling joists are happening here they are again marrying up with these uh, jack rafters and creeper rafters on the end that are forming up the hip. So that gives you an idea there of, of the rafters so again we have our hip rafter 
We have a valley rafter, which is in the internal low point where the roofs meet. We have our common rafters. We have our creeper rafters, which are the ones of varying sizes that get bigger and bigger up the hip. And then we have our jack crown end rafter happening at the end of the hip there. Okay, so to form up our gable, our gable end here though, we do need something to support this verge rafter happening out here. So this is where we will now have our end wall and our outriggers all turned on. So we turn on our end wall and our outriggers. So you can see the end wall now has been framed up so that it can support outriggers. So the outriggers are essentially running between this last rafter here. It's running out, it's supported on top of our end wall, our gable end wall, and then they're overhanging to support the verge rafters. And that's how we form up our gable ends. Now the last member to look at now are the supports to reduce the span of these common rafters. So in some instances the common rafters are simply spanning too far and they need a support in the middle and this is where we use our underpurlins. So our underpurlins are being used here in the same way as our hanging beam was being used for the ceiling joists. So the underpurlins generally sit halfway between the top plate and the ridge board and they will be supporting those common rafters there with the greater span. So you can see them on either side of this main rafter structure and then again because this crown jack, the, sorry, the jack crown end rafter here because it's the same length as our common rafters here it needs the support as well. Now note though that there is nothing there at the moment that is currently supporting our underpurlins. So the underpurlins are transferring the load from the roof sheeting to the roof battens to the rafters to the underpurlins and then they need to transfer that load further down into the wall frame. So this is where we now need to turn on our struts. So our struts can come and they can sit down on internal walls. So see we have a strut here that is supporting this uh, underpurl and the underpurlin is cantilevering out from it. So we can have upright struts like that one or we can use uh, struts uh, are off on an angle, um, so we don't have a wall directly under the end of, of this underpearl in here, but we do have one a little bit offset, so we can put them on the angle. Now note though that we didn't have a wall to support the other end of this underpearl, but we do have our counter beam coming through that is carrying our hanging beam. So if we decide to make that counter beam a combined strutting counter beam, we can have this strut coming down and sitting on top of it. So now the combined strutting uh, counter beam can carry both roof load and ceiling load. While the counter beam is just a counter beam, it can only carry ceiling load. But the minute we make it a combined strutting and counter beam, it can carry both the roof load and the ceiling load. And therefore it needs to be designed accordingly using a different table in a span table in AS 1684. And finally, the last member, I know I already said that, sorry, but the last member now that we are going to turn on are our collar ties. So our collar ties sit directly above our underpurlins here and they tie together at that midpoint uh, the opposing pairs of rafters. So AS1684 says that uh, they need to be fixed to every second pair of rafters or at no more than 1200 spacings, uh, whichever is, is the lesser. And uh, so that's why we don't have them on every pair of rafters here. These rafters are at, at less than 600 spacings, so we've got them on every second pair. And so that's our, that's our collar ties that are coming in there and supporting. Uh, just tying, sorry, together the tops of our rafters there. So there we have our roof structure. That is a very basic uh, understanding there of, of, of how this, this works, but this should hopefully give you some 3D image in your mind now of how all of those different elements work in together.